What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lawyer You Know podcast. And I'm really excited today because the format of the podcast was all about bringing in friends and people that follow true crime cases that become obsessed with them sometimes and love talking about them themselves and with their friends. And when I did it, somebody whose podcast I've been on and I've talked to about a lot of this stuff popped into my head as one of the most perfect guests we could possibly have for this. Um, and many of you probably already know her because she's got one of the biggest true crime podcasts called Seriously and one of the big true crime YouTube channels, 10 to Life. Joining me today is Annie Elise. Thank you Hello. so much for being here. And she's bringing two different cases, not just one. It's our first twofer on the podcast, one that we haven't talked about at all on our channel and one we've been covering pretty extensively so Annie, feel free to introduce yourself. Tell us what you do, where people can find you if I haven't already hit those already and we can jump in. Awesome. Um, well, first, thanks so much for having me. And I'm so excited that I'm the first twofer and I have so many questions. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad that we're doing both cases because I feel like there's a lot to talk about, but I feel like you pretty much did the intro perfectly. I have a awesome. podcast called Serialistly and the Tend to Life is my YouTube. But um, yeah, I, I really want to get into Madeline Soto if we can start there because I've been following this case very closely for several, several months, and I have a lot of questions regarding the legal side of things because there's been a lot of conversation about possible immunity deals, things like that. So let me break down the case for you and kind of just like summarize it, and then I'll get into my questions if that works for you. Perfect. It's perfect. Cool. So earlier in the year, Madeline Soto, she's a 13-year-old little girl, and she was reported missing after her mom went to pick her up from school one day and she wasn't there. So they start asking the mom all these questions. They also start asking the mom's boyfriend, Stefan Stearns, some questions, and nobody seems to know where Madeline is. They say that they dropped her off. I believe it was at the church across the street from the school that morning, and then she walked across the street to school but nobody had seen her since. So she was supposed to be dropped off at school, didn't make it to school. Didn't make it to school. I went to pick her up from school today okay. and she never came out. They, they announced it over the speaker and I'm just like, maybe she walked here because sometimes she'll walk here to this office. Mm -hmm. I came here, nothing. I went back to the school, they were closed. I got a notice, an email from the school saying she was absent, but I also messaged her teacher and he looked at her entire attendance today and saw that she was completely not at school today either. Okay. Um, so she never made it. So as they're trying to look for her and figure out what's going on, they seized the boyfriend Stefan's device. And when they looked in that, they found hundreds and thousands of explicit images and videos of child abuse material. Sexual in nature, of course. I want to be careful how I say this because I know YouTube can be, you know, crazy mm -hmm. with that. But they found all these images and a lot of them were of him and Madeline, the daughter. And I believe that some of them dated back even before she was 11 years old. Wow. So immediately, that obviously isn't good, but she hasn't been found. So they start doing more interviews. They start looking into things and ultimately they end up finding her body. They also, when they were looking at the CCTV footage, they saw Stefan leave with Madeline in the car that morning when he was supposed to have been dropping her off at school. It looks as though she was kind of slumped over and he says she was sleeping in the car. They believe she was already dead at that point. Hmm. Then they see him later drive back into the apartment complex, toss her work or her, I'm sorry, her school issued laptop in the dumpster, some other things. And then they start piecing everything together and, of course, saw all of that material on his device. So they end up arresting him after she's, she's found. She was, I believe, she was suffocated or strangled to death. I would have to go back and just, like, double check exactly what it was. And they started asking the mom, like, what's the history here? What's going on? Clearly, like, we found all this material. She acts as though she has no clue as to what that relationship was and what the dynamic is. However, during some of her interviews with law enforcement, she does say interesting things the way she phrases them, such as, and I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing here, guys, so don't come after me. But if, say, they were saying, like, okay, well, why would you have them sleep together and share a bed? She was like, even if he did something like that, that's not evil. Murdering her is evil. And she would say it in a roundabout way to where it almost sounded as though she was excusing any and not maybe covering for him, but it just has rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And all of these interviews have been being released over the last several weeks where everybody's, of course, dissecting every single moment of them. But the big question so many people in the true crime community have that I'm interested to hear your take on is that starting from the beginning, the stories weren't really lining up when Madeline was just missing. It seemed as though 
maybe her mom wasn't involved in the murder, but perhaps more of the cover up after the fact and was trying to help her boyfriend that she probably knew more. Maybe she even knew that there was some grooming, some abuse happening, all of these things, but was covering for him. So everybody's now wondering why hasn't she been arrested or charged with anything? And there's some rumors that she possibly has struck up some sort of deal with them and that she won't be prosecuted. But I don't think we have concrete evidence of that either way. However, what I'm curious about just from your perspective is if there was any sort of immunity deal in play where if she helps cooperate, she won't be, you know, rolled in with the charges, whether it's, you know, murder, the cover up, the cover, anything after the fact. What if it does prove that there was more involvement or perhaps that she w- she did know about the abuse what because it was ongoing for so long and she was complicit in that and the child endangerment like is there a way to add on more after the fact even if there is already a deal in place and then how does that how does that look i guess is my question so when it comes to immunity deals it's almost like it feels like there are no rules the prosecutors can do a lot of different things they can change them they can put different language in them and if they're not going to prosecute the judge can't really force a prosecutor to prosecute somebody especially if they're deciding to use them as a witness against the main defendant in this case which would be the boyfriend um so from the perspective of things changing and when she could potentially be involved or what crimes she could potentially be involved in as long as they cover everything in an immunity deal, which is a defense attorney's job, right? Where it's like, my client's coming forward. She may have done things in the past. She doesn't even know our criminal in nature. Uh, She may explain things in the future that we didn't even know about, but we need everything for her to be immune from everything connected to this, her daughter, her boyfriend, before, after, abuse, murder, whatever it is, she needs to be immune from all of it. And if they really need her as a witness or want her as a witness and find that to be the best path to justice against the boyfriend, Uh, Then they could write all that in the immunity deal. So whether she talks about originally when it started, she was fine with it. She condoned it. She knew about it. Uh, She didn't think it was that big of a deal or that evil, like you said, maybe with some of the comments all the way up until if she helped cover it, cover it up. All of that could potentially be covered in an immunity deal. um, And she would have to then testify against him or at least purport to testify against him, which would then potentially make him take some kind of deal, plead guilty, uh, maybe get life. I know he's looking at the death penalty potentially and so much more with all of the charges that they have, tons of charges with um, the child abuse and and in nature. So uh, there is a potential for them to cover everything in an immunity deal, which I know a lot of people will be mad about, right? And they would think that's not justice um, for the daughter. That's not justice for Madeline Soto because her mom was in on it. Her mom hurt her too. Her mom was supposed to be protecting her and did exactly the opposite. Her mom is potentially even the reason this boyfriend was in her life, right? So there is that aspect that everything could be covered, but every immunity deal is a little bit different. Some immunity deals put in there, whatever you say when you're testifying in this situation can't be used against you in the future. So even if you break this immunity deal, even if you lie, even if you do something that's not covered, whatever you tell us can't be used to go get further evidence against you. But the more common immunity deal is if you lie, you're screwed. Everything you've told us, we can now use against you. We can prosecute you for everything. If you lied about the cover up, now you're out. We can go get you for the child abuse. We can get you for child endangerment. We can get you for accessory after the fact. We can get you for all the crimes we potentially think we can now that we have your own statements on the record against your boyfriend, but that also inculpate you and make you now guilty of certain crimes. So if she does lie, if she tells one story and then it changes, which it seems like you're saying has happened multiple times. If it changes again and they say, okay, now that's it. We're breaking the immunity deal. But the last caveat with lawyers, there's always so many caveats and it depends. They can also say, okay, you lied. So we could break that immunity deal or you can testify about now that new stuff against him too and the immunity deal is still good. So it's kind of a fluid situation, almost like a settlement document that as long as both sides agree can continue to evolve and change. Okay, so let me ask you this. That kind of brought two questions to my mind. One, if they from, say from like the get-go, if when they were looking through the material on his devices, let's just say, and I want to be very clear, this has never been stated and this is not a fact. Yeah, it's just my, something that popped in my brain. If they saw an image where, not that she was participating, but say it was like he was doing something with Madeline in the bed and she was on the side of the bed and they saw that she did have more insight and she knew what was going on how likely is it that they would strike an immunity deal with somebody like that? Is it strictly because they would need her that badly as a witness against him? Or I guess that's my question is more rooted in 
what are the parameters and the requirements in order to even get an immunity deal? Do they need you that badly that they're willing to do that, even if they think you were complicit? So it's it's always a case by case basis. The two biggest factors are number one, how bad do they need them to get the ultimate perpetrator and the person that justice would prevail most by punishing worst, right? So that that's the most important um, uh, thing that they look at. But also, would you be able to prove the guilt of the witness? And would it be a little gray area? Would it be harder? Would people think it was more the husband or the boyfriend and not her? So is it even worth it to go after her? And additionally, in this case, which overcomplicates it, I don't know what the family dynamics are, but it's her daughter, right? So she would technically be the victim's family as well. So who are you getting justice for? Obviously, Madeline Soto. But in other cases, if the mom was not involved, she would be pushing for justice for who did this to her daughter. It's a little different in this case, unless, you know, grandparents or aunts. I know the the community at large is really pushing for it. But when you go into it as a prosecutor in this case, and you know how horrible these facts are, and I've looked into it a little bit since you mentioned you wanted to bring it up on this, you have to realize and know that if you're giving this human being who either allowed or participated in this abuse of her daughter, you have to realize that you're potentially letting a monster off in order to get the more evil person or more deserving person. So you probably would assume that there is some dirt and some nastiness that you're going to uncover throughout this investigation. And you've got to be ready for that, knowing that something could pop up where she was involved, especially if she said she was complicit. And then you're going to have to make the decision. Do you throw it out? Do you not use her to testify against the defendant anymore? And now you go after her. And that's a decision that each prosecutor would make on a case by case basis. Okay. So that brings up an interesting point too, because again, there has been no proof indicating that she has struck any sort of deal whatsoever, but because they found the material on his phone and they saw him on the CCTV footage and all of these different things, again, I I couldn't tell you one way or another what other additional evidence they have, but it appears as though they would have a strong enough case against Stefan without necessarily needing her mom to be a witness or testify against him. So in that case too, taking that into consideration, would they offer immunity to somebody like that? Or in your experience, would you think that that would be enough evidence that that would suffice that they would feel confident in going forward with those charges and not give her immunity? Because we still don't know if she does have it one way or another. This seems completely locked and loaded against the boyfriend, against Stefan. Like from my perspective, if I was prosecuting the case, I'd be like, we're good. We've got everything we need. What I would do though, um, if it was my decision is, I would probably see if there are charges appropriate for the mom and I would probably file those charges and then I would give her some kind of a lesser sentence if she pled and testified against uh, Stefan. So if you did have the evidence, which I don't know, I'm not saying that they do or don't, but if you did, I probably would and give her a lesser sentence or some kind of probation, but still convicted of a felony. There's lots of different things you can do to where she still is held accountable, but also testifies against Stefan where she doesn't have to just walk away free because in the cases usually where you walk away free, but you had a lot of dirt on your hands, it's because they don't have CCTV. They don't have the pictures. I got to be honest, you show those pictures on his phone and he's the last one with her. Like what jury is not going to think he's the one that did this? You know, he's innocent. He's presumed innocent. As crazy as that sounds, as he sits in jail right now in Florida, he is presumed innocent. But the amount of evidence that comes out publicly is different in every case. And from his perspective, there's a lot of evidence that we know about. And there's always the opportunity, like you said, that there's a lot of evidence we don't know about. So at this point, just from what we know, it looks like he's cooked. We'll see if that's what ends up coming out in trial. But that's kind of the analysis a prosecutor goes through with making deals with witnesses that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. It doesn't have to be you walk away scot-free. There can be some kind of middle ground sometimes if you feel like you don't need her, but you'd like her to testify against Stephanie. And how long would you, and again, I know we don't know the ins and outs of the case, but how long would you wait to bring even lesser charges against her? Because I guess that's where the gray area is right now to the public. They're like, she hasn't been charged with anything yet, yet this and this, 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 nothing's adding up. So surely that must be because she has a deal in place. But again, we don't know that. So it could just be that either A, they don't have enough to charge her and there is no deal in place. B, maybe she does have a deal. Or C, maybe they're waiting to charge her because they're still investigating. And so I guess like at what point would you expect there to be charges against her if they did have knowledge that she was involved in any sort of way? So that's a great question. And actually the first step we would always take is as long as you can wait, you wait. If she's going to talk to you, she's going to talk to you. I've seen like interviews of her. So, I mean, she's talking. 
Maybe she's mm-hmm. not telling them everything. Maybe she's not giving them everything they need or they want, or they know she's lying about certain things, but she is talking to them. So she is somewhat cooperative with them. So as long as you have that, you ride it. You don't give a deal if you don't need to, but you wait as long as you can. And eventually if you think you need to, or at some point she says, okay, I'm not going to testify anymore. or I'm not going to tell you this or that. That's usually when you see the charges start coming, the deals start coming. Sometimes immunity deals come without charges, right? They just say, if she's going to plead the fifth, let's say they're planning on calling her as a witness and she gets a lawyer and the lawyer says she's not going to testify, she's going to plead the fifth. Then you can give immunity to force them to testify and no longer allow them to plead the fifth because you can only plead the fifth if there is potential criminal charges or potentially incriminating things that you're going to say when answering questions. So the prosecutor can literally force people to testify by saying, there's no fifth amendment because there's no criminal charges. We are not going to make it possible for anything you say to be incriminating. Therefore, take the stand, testify, you've got immunity. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. We talk about so many difficult topics on this channel, whether it's a case, a story, a person. We dive into some of life's most difficult topics and some situations that feel impossible to deal with. Well, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So whatever life's difficult moment is, sometimes therapy can really help. Sometimes talking to someone, a professional, is exactly what we need. So I encourage you to visit betterhelp.com L-Y-K to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, dot com slash L-Y-K for lawyer you know for 10% off your first month. Okay, I didn't know that and that my brain is like going a million miles an hour right now because that's gonna bring me to what I wanna ask you about Diddy. Uh, um, okay, I didn't know that. So then what happens if the judge says like, there or whoever, there's immunity, you have to testify, you can't plead the fifth and they choose not to, is that when they're then held in contempt and they face other things? Have you heard at all about the YSL trial in Georgia? No. Okay. It's, it's wild, right? Isn't it wild how worlds collide? Like this thing is like exploding here. The criminal justice system, everybody's got a problem with it. So it's all these different rappers like Young Thug and some other guys arrested for RICO charges at state level. Um, but there was a witness named Little Woody or Woody, something like that, who flipped and snitched on them allegedly and then was called as a witness, no longer wanted to testify, um, pled the fifth, because he was involved, you know, potentially at certain sites when crimes were committed, pled the fifth. They gave him immunity. He said he still refused to testify. They threw him in jail for multiple days. There was this big ex parte hearing with the judge where they're like, you have to testify. They're giving you immunity. So whatever you say, you can't be held uh, responsible for, and you're not going to be convicted of it. You're not going to be arrested. You're not going to be charged. And he said, well, what if I lie? And they're like, well, the only thing that you could be charged with is if you lie about this specific thing. So they're basically coaching them on how to testify. They didn't tell the defense attorneys about the ex parte hearing. It was a big legal thing. But generally speaking, that's exactly what happened to him. They arrested him, put him in the orange jumpsuit. And the only thing, he was held in contempt. And the only way he could get out, it wasn't a specific sentence. It was only until he corrected the wrong. So basically, they could have held him in prison for this entire trial, for next trial, until he decided to testify against them because he was held in contempt of court for refusing to testify when he could not have a fifth amendment privilege because they had already given him immunity. So they can like force immunity deals on witnesses in different scenarios. And this could be a scenario where they do that as well. Okay. So now tell me this, and this might be a dumb question. I'm sorry, but curious. So for situations where it's like the mafia or the mob, whether somebody has committed a crime and is forced to testify or not, but they refuse because they don't want to be a rat and they don't want to have the retaliation to be killed for, you know, flipping or turning or ratting on somebody. What does that look like? Do they ever, if they just refuse to speak altogether, whether they would be charged or not? So I I really encourage you to take a minute afterwards and watch the little Woody testimony, honestly. Anybody that's listening to the podcast, she's asking this question and we all now know what it looks like. So it's very rare that something like this happens specifically like this, but you're saying the mob, they're charged with RICO Street right. gang activities are the allegations. And this is what his testimony sounded like. I don't remember. I don't remember. Well, you said this. I lied. Well, did you lie then or did you lie now? I always lie. I'm a liar. What I do is lie. You can't trust anything I said. That's literally what he's saying on the stand. 
And so yeah. the jury is sitting here with a prosecution witness. They're reading all his impeachment statements like, well, you said Young Thug did this. You said Young Thug did that. He goes, I lied. I was just trying to get the heat off me. So now it's like, is the jury going to believe his, his statements prior or his statements in court? I mean, he's admitting that he's a liar. How much credence are you going to put behind that? So if certain people, like you're saying, in mobs or gangs or groups or whatever that don't want to be a snitch and don't want to flip on somebody and they're just like, nah, I made all that up because they don't care. Like this guy doesn't care and he's been given immunity. So it's like, they're not going to arrest him for this. It's a very strange situation, which is why it's rare, but it, it's not usually a great setup for somebody to be a really killer witness for a prosecution team. If you have to literally put handcuffs on them, throw them in jail, get force an immunity deal on them and put them on the stand. They're not going to be, you know, a star witness for you. Well, I guess. And my whole question uh, for why, like the whole reason why I'm asking that is because what would stop Madeline's mom from pretend she's never done any interview. She's not cooperating. There's no deal. She never was involved. Like maybe she knew about it, but like, there's no proof, no evidence showing that what would stop her from when they call her as a witness to testify her, just kind of doing the exact same thing. I mean, like, I don't know anything. Well, we saw you in that picture. I don't remember. I don't like to where she just could kind of go mute with everything. Or is there some sort of other step that they could take in that? So what, if she's going to do that, she should just plead the fifth. Then mm -hmm. if they give her immunity and she says, I don't know, usually the immunity, it, it can, it depends on how you set it up, can include perjury. So if you admit lying before or whatever, they're not going to charge you with that. So those are kind of the steps is you've got to plead the fifth first. And then, and, and I'm not, I'm never, obviously just to make this as clear as possible, not telling anybody to go lie or say they don't remember if they do. But I'm saying, if you really don't remember and what he says he does, he said it was years ago. He said, I literally couldn't keep my lies straight because I was telling them whatever they wanted to hear to get my butt saved. I didn't care who I was pointing the finger at. So if Madeline or if uh, Madeline Soto's mom says, I was just trying to point the finger at Stefan because I didn't want them coming after me, which is plausible and could be true. If that's what she says after pleading the fifth, that's very well what it could look like. It doesn't seem like that at this point, but I also think the prosecutors didn't think little Woody was going to do this when he was testifying against the defendants, when he was at the police station during the interrogations, talking to cops, pointing fingers at everybody. So it could happen. I think it's it's less likely in a situation like this than when you have a an organization like the mom or a gang or something like the mob or a gang, something like that. But it is possible that she says eventually, like I plead the fifth, especially if she feels the heat coming down on her, starts to think charges are coming. If there's a public outcry for charges to come, she could eventually start pleading the fifth and not get into the testimony that everybody's interested in. Okay. That's interesting. Well, uh, thank you for answering all that because that now is going to like tee me up for all these other questions that I have regarding Diddy because I have so many questions and I really want to pick your brain on this. So everybody for the most part knows what's going on right now, of course, right? He's been arrested. He's been charged with horrific things. As of last week, I believe it was, they had talked to over 3000 people. They found credibility in about 120 of those statements to bring civil suits. When that attorney was speaking out, um, I believe his name was Tony, he was saying something to the effect of the names that are involved in these suits will shock you. It goes mm -hmm. so much deeper than what everybody knows. And so now everybody's speculating, okay, what A-listers are going to be named? Who else is involved? Is it Jay-Z, Beyonce, Usher, Justin Bieber as a victim? All of these things. And one of the other things that I hear the most is everybody's fearful that something similar to what happened to Epstein may happen, that either he kills himself while he's waiting trial or somebody kills him while he's in there and that no answers come of this. So I guess my first question for you is what happens if he does die while he's being held, whether it's himself or somebody else, whatever the reason is, does the case die with him? What happens to all of the information, all of the discovery, all of the potential pending lawsuits that are going on. Does everything just get frozen in time? So in case anybody hasn't realized, we've transitioned into case number two and that's Diddy's case. So <laughs> sorry, I mean, you're, you're, good. you're good. We're just jumping right in. We're jumping right in. It's perfect. So, so Diddy's charges are federal. They're racketeering, they're Rico, uh, criminal organization, um, including doing all of these things to some kids, some adults with the freak offs, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we have all these allegations. We've heard about Diddy's white parties and everything like that and everybody that was there and ain't no party like a Diddy party and Diddy mentioned in everybody's song. So who could be involved potentially has been a big question. Tony Busby is the civil lawyer that you mentioned, held the big press conference, explained, you're gonna be shocked. We've heard other lawyers or victims saying there's somebody even more high profile than Diddy in some of these videos. All of this tease and we don't really know who anybody is. 
you have to be careful, right? As you know, if you're going to take a swing at somebody like that, you better be sure. And that's basically what Tony Busby said is we're confirming everything. That's why there's only 120 victims they had at that point out of 3,000 calls. doesn't mean they're fake victims. It just means 120 people that they feel like they have enough evidence to go forward on. Um, but if Diddy passes, does all this go away? That's your, that's your basic question, it sounds like. Yes. And does everybody get hidden? Does everybody get to go back into the woodworks and do whatever they want to do? And the answer is hopefully not. But when it comes to the criminal charges currently against Diddy, Puff Daddy, et cetera, Sean Combs individually, those charges completely go away if he dies in a process called abatement. So if you die with pending charges, um, and there are certain scenarios where we'll, we'll just stick with Diddy for this one. These charges would all go away. They'd be completely terminated, which means he wouldn't be convicted of anything. There wouldn't be criminal, quote unquote, justice for these victims. There wouldn't be criminal restitution that these victims would be able to prove in a monetary amount to where Diddy would pay them through the criminal justice system. All of that would go away. That would be completely gone in the criminal world. But that's part of the beauty of the civil justice system. So now that Tony Busby is involved, you can still sue Diddy's estate. You can still get damages from the money that, that Diddy leaves behind because none of it is going to be seized by the government anymore. It'll go through the probate process, his family or his will, whatever he's, whoever he's leaving what to. But the victims would be able to file lawsuits and still try to collect from that estate. So that's number one. So there would be still potential money for the victims to try and make them whole, which, as you understand, is probably impossible at this point. Um, but number two is information and other defendants. And the civil justice system and the criminal justice system could still provide some justice in that scenario. Number one, we already know from Tony Busby that some of these other high profile people are going to be civil defendants. So even if Diddy dies, they can still progress the civil charges and they can still even get a discovery from Diddy personally, from his estate, from his phone, from his recordings. They can still get that and use it against the other civil defendants, you know, assuming that it's there, right? The, the criminal charges with the actual federal government, they have a lot more access and potentially the civil lawyers will be able to get access to their files if they want to cooperate, if something like that does happen. And we could still hear who those other defendants are. We could still see civil lawsuits against those other defendants. And we can see, still see potential justice against those defendants. And if there's a lot more people, sorry, this is a long question. It was a, it was a multifaceted no, question. Please, trying continue. to get all the answers. <laughs> um, in the criminal justice system, some of those people as accessories could still be prosecuted. Now, right now they may be working deals. They may be trying to get people to flip and stitch on Diddy, or he could be pointing the finger at other people. But regardless if Diddy passes, because there's such an uproar and public perception and public outrage can make a difference in cases like this to where they're still going to get justice. And maybe even some of the lesser involved, um, I don't know if it's politicians, celebrities, whoever it may be involved, could still see criminal prosecutions coming their way, especially if the biggest fish is taken out. Thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking look easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh has tons of options, and they change every week so you don't get bored. And we like to pick a couple different options, some that sound amazing of things that we've had before, but we also like to try something that we would never make on our own or wouldn't know how to because it's a great combo to keep dinner fun. We also like to choose meals that fit our family schedule for that week. Usually we go fit and wholesome, but always quick and easy. That's a must for us. From heart healthy dinners to game day snacks, HelloFresh is a go-to. Whether your team wins or not, thank God. Get 10 free meals at hellofresh.com slash free L Y K applied across seven boxes, new subscribers only and varies by plan. That's 10 free HelloFresh meals just by going to hellofresh.com slash free L Y K F R E E L Y K. So go get yours today. Okay. So then that kind of, I guess, dovetails into my next question a little bit. We know that, or we assume that it runs pretty deep and that there's a lot of other people involved. And we've heard people, of course, say that they will be named all of that. I would imagine that Diddy's team, everybody back in the day when he was having the freak offs, all of these things were happening, that he had them signing, you know, NDAs, whatever information he was, had these videos allegedly with that are blackmail. If there is, if they're starting to go through their evidence and they say, see, I'm just going to make this completely up, that Usher was involved in some of this. Okay. If whether uh, if Usher had signed any legal paperwork, NDAs, whatever it is, 
is that negated and does that go away? And is he forced then to testify and be a witness or is there some sort of legal loophole in any of that? So again, we'll, and we'll try to keep the civil and criminal justice system separate. When it comes to the criminal justice system and the feds, they don't care about NDAs. It doesn't matter if you signed an NDA, they can still come force you to testify. Mm -hmm. um, on the civil side, NDAs can block certain things, but a lot of times, and it really depends on the document, right? Lawyers can get creative in how they write these documents, but most of the time, NDAs, I've written NDAs myself. Um, one of my buddies, I don't know, I'm not gonna get into that. So no, so, get into uh, it. Is, 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 so it's, one of my buddies works with like a bunch of athletes and there's some weird NDAs and stuff that they want written up. It's just kind of funny the world everybody lives in. But for the most part, NDAs, if you violate them, let's say, let's say I'm going to invite you over to my house and whatever happens, you got to sign this NDA that you're not going to disclose it. There has to be some teeth to it, right? So if you do disclose it, then what happens? So if you go and you disclose it on your podcast, like, what am I really going to do to you? Am I going to mm -hmm. sue you? Like, I'd have to show you damaged me somehow. And from Puff Daddy's situation, are they really going to damage him any more than he already is? What money is he going to lose by somebody coming and testifying? If he, in this situation, it's happened as well, gave him $10,000 for the NDA. If they violate that NDA, potentially Usher's team could, I mean, uh, Puff Daddy's team could file a lawsuit saying you violated the NDA. You owe us that $10,000 back. Okay, big deal. Come get it. You know, who's going to who's gonna ever side with Puffy on that one? But th those are the kind of teeth that come with it is there's a monetary value that if you violate the NDA, they can sue you for. Um, if there were employment contracts that he would throw in there. And, and by the way, some people throw stuff in NDA, not myself, but some people throw stuff that's completely illegal and impossible that you can't actually do. Like, you know, Bad Boy Records is going to terminate your contract if you tell somebody about the freak offs. Well, that is technically illegal from telling people they can't... Um, uh, go tell the cops about crimes committed. So you can't really violate their contract or cancel the contract. That would be an employment lawsuit. Then on top of the criminal charges coming, which is a convoluted way to say that there's all sorts of threats that are in NDAs that sometimes are not, that don't have the teeth that they seem that they, that they may have because they're either it's like, okay, I'm going to tell them, then what are you going to do to me? Like you're in mm -hmm. jail now. What are you going to sue me? You're going to try to make me look bad. You're going to ruin my career. Cause I think a lot less people will be worried about that now than maybe a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago with Puff Daddy. So the NDAs lose a lot of their teeth when there's just monetary value you might not care about or threats that Diddy can no longer make good on because obviously his reputation is uh, in the toilet right now. So I, I don't think the NDAs are going to be as big of a block as maybe lay people may think they would have been if you were just to read with the, the words on the paper. Now, the, thinking forward to the trial itself, it's of course a federal trial. We're not going to see it play out. I would imagine it's not going to be like the Johnny Depp Amber Heard one where everybody's glued to it is my guess. But in your professional experience, how do you see this playing out? Do you think that there are going to be a lot of people who are named or that come forward willingly testifying? Do you think some of these A-list alleged victims will also come and testify? And maybe that's why they haven't spoken out yet since all of the news of his arrest broke. Where do you see this going? So Tony Busby said as well that he's going to try to do as many Jane Doe's and John Doe's as he can. And the court does a balancing test there as the, the public's right to know who the victims are, the defendant's right to know who the victims are with fear of their safety and, and life. Um, so we may not hear some of the victims' names there. So this is unprecedented. We'll start with that, right? I can't remember anything quite like this. These kinds of charges with somebody as famous and as rich and as big as and connected as Puff Daddy. Um, but... I also am a little bit of a pessimist or a realist when it comes to this stuff, because how many times have we heard about names and lists and we're going to know the people involved and they're going to be taken down and then they just aren't and people mm -hmm. still continue to kind of be untouchable and we still are waiting and it's like, it just kind of fades away as the news cycle changes and those same people own mainstream media so they can make the narrative what they want it to do. Right. And so it's, it's all of these people that are, you know, alleged to be involved that are also so powerful and control so much of this that I don't know. I, I, I can't say with any confidence that we're going to hear names, that we're going to be shocked, that change is really going to happen in Hollywood or in politics or whoever's involved. I can't really say that. And I'll say one of the differences between federal court, there's no cameras. It's big boy court. It's way more strict. The, the judges are appointed for life. They have no fear of any backlash of any decision they make that they might get voted out. And the conviction rate is close to 100%. Um, especially on cases like this. So it's very different than state court. It's not going to look anything like the YSL case for anybody that's following that. And they hear, oh, that's Rico. And this is Rico. It's not going to be anything like that. So 
thinking back a little bit too, just and sorry to jump back and forth, but regarding the NDAs and how we were talking about the witness list or people testifying with Cassie Ventura, we obviously all saw that video that was horrific. We mm -hmm. know that she settled, I believe it was before December of last year. And I forget what the exact amount was. It was 20 or 40. That's what I heard. I can't remember exactly. But because she settled and who knows what that looked like, could they potentially bring her in as well in this case to speak out? Or is that now closed and done because of the settlement? So potentially again, in the civil side, that may be enough money to where she doesn't want to testify. She doesn't want to violate that settlement agreement. I don't know what's in the settlement agreement, but sometimes you can say non-disparagement. You can't say X, Y, or Z. Um, but there's also a lot of caveats. Again, this is a public policy thing where we as lawyers, sometimes we want to put certain things in a, in a settlement agreement, but you can't. And one of those things is testifying in a criminal case where if the FBI calls and they're like, hey, you're coming in, we're talking to you, her civil settlement agreement is not going to block that, is not going to stop that for the most part. Even if they did write something like that in, for the most part, it's not going to be enough to keep her from testifying criminally. Um, but on the civil side, there are potential things you can do to block or limit. Or if she does testify, then Diddy's attorneys, it may be worth it for them to take it to a judge and just as a matter of law, say, judge, she violated the settlement agreement, so give us the 20, 30, 40 million dollars back. And then she can go through again and file another lawsuit and prove it. And then we'll see if there's any money for you at the end. Good luck. Does she want to take that risk? Those are potential questions. Again, it all depends on what's in the settlement agreement, but there could be potential blockades in the civil realm with that settlement agreement. Okay. And then my other question with that would be, if there are people who are named either as a witness or if there are people who are coming forward and giving information because they are powerful people and I would imagine have amazing attorneys and people on staff, would you think that all of them are striking some sort of deal or arrangement to where their testimony, even if it is you know, self-incriminating and they could be charged that it is going to block all of that, whether it was an usher involved or a Jay-Z or somebody to where if they're like, okay, we are going to talk and speak out because my reputation is being tarnished since I'm not saying anything that I need to probably get on, the, on board with this and like, you know, denounce him. But here I want this agreement in place so that I can't get any backlash or charges can't come to me. Yeah. I mean, we obviously don't know at this point who's involved. Um, it's all just hypothetical. It's all just allegations yeah. or people trying to guess or follow trails. So every person is going to have their own individual decisions to make and balancing act to do. But yeah, I think you got to be very careful in this situation where if you're going to flip, if you're going to testify, if you're going to make some kind of deal, what are you going to look like in that deal? And is it worth it to you? And, you know, some of these people have so much money that it's like, whatever, fine. I'm done making money. My reputation is tarnished. I'll just move to another country and live on a private island by myself. Then maybe it's worth it for them to, you know, flip, testify against Diddy. But each one of them has to realize that they're going to be crucified as well if they admit to being involved in this, they're going to be looked at as one of the group with Diddy that was doing this to everybody. Um, they are going to be villainized, number one. Number two, it's pretty much going to be per se, you're screwed on the civil side as well and add them to all the lawsuits and everybody's going to be suing them as well because in criminal world, you're not going to go to prison. There's not going to be criminal charges against you. Hooray for you, you're testifying against Diddy. But a lot of people, when they get immunity agreements, have to admit their wrongdoing as well. And any wrongdoing criminally you admit to can be used against you in civil cases. And I would expect all the civil lawyers to be following this very closely. And every single person that flips, even if they weren't already on the civil lawsuits before, will find their name on the civil lawsuits. And they'll be knocking at their door, especially if Diddy runs out of money, which I don't know how that's possible when you have as much money as him. But Yeah, I know. Well, okay. So then I guess with that, that all makes sense. But, and this is just a personal opinion question I have for you. Why do you think it's been weeks now since he's been arrested and all of this information is coming out. People are sharing their stories. And while he hasn't been proven guilty, a hundred percent, I understand that. Why do you think nobody in the A-list world who has ever rubbed shoulders with him or done anything has made even a single statement saying, if these allegations prove to be true, our thoughts and hearts are with the victims or something even to that effect. It, just everybody is completely radio silent. And I think that's what's unnerving for so many people in the public as well. So there's a couple interesting aspects. Like just when you said that, what popped into my head, I don't know. Did you follow the Gabby Petito case at all? Yes. Okay. So it popped in my head that Brian Laundrie's parents lawyer went on and said something like, 
we hope she's okay. And they felt like they had to say something, right? We hope she's okay and she gets returned to you. And now that is the basis of a lawsuit, not just against the parents, but also against the lawyer. And so if you do have any wrongdoing, if you are going to flip, if you're afraid of something like that happening, coming out and saying something like that could open you up to potential civil liability, number one. Number two, I think, I don't want to you know, go too far out on a limb here, but I think probably the reason you're asking the question is it's kind of damning that nobody is coming out and saying anything. And I think sometimes people are going to look bad for that. Number two, I have seen some people actually come out and say certain things like, um, and I'm not going to mention anybody just in case they, they don't like any of these people, but, and then I've seen them get crucified back. Like, here's a picture of you and him. Here's you rubbing shoulders with him. Here's you sitting next to him at the Grammys or whatever. So regardless of your involvement, if they've ever seen you in a picture with P Diddy, which if you're a big enough celebrity, it might exist, right? It doesn't mean you were in on it just because there's a picture of you with him. Um, so I think they may be afraid of some kind of public backlash like that. But at the end of the day, it's all going to be allegations. The silence is deafening. And I think as so many of these federal investigations, the first domino to drop, if you want to call it the first domino, it's more like a bombshell, all of this coming down on Diddy, the dust starts to rise. Everything mm -hmm. starts to be frantic. Everybody starts freaking out. Are people going to make mistakes? Are the feds just waiting for more information to come out, for people to make mistakes, for people to reach out to them and say, hey, I want to flip. I have information even if I'm involved, can I get immunity, whatever it may be through their lawyers or themselves, that could also be part of this because these cases are long and drawn out. These don't happen in two, three, four months. These can take, you know, one to two to three years, potentially, and sometimes even longer. Usually federal criminal cases go quicker, but there's going to be a lot of time for people to be uncovered or become involved in something like this. Well, I guess that's kind of where I'm coming from too. And the reason I asked that is because, and I'm, again, I'm only saying these names guys, cause it's the first ones that come to mind. It, there's been absolutely no proof indicating there's knowledge or involvement, but the Beyonce's of the world, the ushers of the world, the Jay-Z's of the world, if they're not even speaking out, cause of course there are photos with them 1000%, but saying he was always my friend. We never knew about any of this information or what was going on. We, you know, if this is proves to be true, we are sickened and we apologize or, you know, our hearts are with you. So my question, I guess, with that is if those statements aren't even being made just at the simplest form, just like a humanity level from these people, is it because to your point of what you had just said, they don't want to make any statements if there is something in the future coming down the pike, potentially, whether it's a civil or them testifying or whatever it may be. So then with that, I guess the two part question is, is it safe to assume that everybody who is not speaking out right now may possibly have either be looped in or have to speak in the future, or there's a reason behind that, that there's intent and strategy behind it. So I would say emphatically no, that everybody that's not speaking, I would not think is going to end up looped in. I would guess, because most of these people are powerful, rich, you know, involved people. I would guess most of them if they have any fear at all, if they've been to a party, even if they didn't do anything wrong, if they've been to his house, if they have any business relationship with him, my guess is they've all got lawyers at this point. And basically every single lawyer would say, just shut up. Don't mm -hmm. say anything because what you say or the way you say it, because we've also seen in situations like, oh, they said this, let's read into it. They didn't say that. Oh, look at the look on their face. Let's break down their body language and see if they were telling the truth or if they were lying that can all be used against you. We saw Alec Baldwin come out and do his interview. A lot of people think that hurt him. He ended up, you know, at the end, victorious, I guess, if you want to call it that. But, you know, coming out and making public statements can be used against you. It can end up being bad for you. I get it. You've got to deal with, you know, people like you and the lay people that are looking this, following this, trying to figure out the truth, trying to figure out what happened, looking at them like side eye. And you got to understand mm -hmm. that that's going to be the risk of you keeping quiet. But are you going to listen to what your lawyer says or not? Some lawyers, some PR teams may tell people to come out and speak. Like you said, I haven't seen a lot of that. So once you see nobody talking and nobody coming out and saying anything, maybe you're hoping, you know, these hurricanes coming or the election or whatever is going to be the next media cycle and people stop talking about it. That's really interesting. Well, okay. I have to ask you this. I know we said two cases, but I kind of have a third I want to ask sure. you how sure. now that we just went over that. Okay. The reason I, that this came to mind specifically is because it is something that is back in the news cycle that so many people are talking about, and it's the Menendez brothers. Mm -hmm. And 
I have asked, I, Matt Murphy was at my tour. He was the special guest in San Diego. And I asked him his thoughts on that. He was the former DA here in Orange County and I wanted to pick his brain, but I'm just, there's something for me that I'm so confused about and stuck on because I understand for years now, the public, especially Gen Z has been advocating for their release that they were victims in all of this and that there was the abuse happening and that they should have never even been convicted. And they definitely certainly shouldn't have had these lengthy sentences. And now with the new Netflix docuseries, and I think the actual new documentary that drops the seventh today, I believe Mm -hmm. um, it's call everybody's kind of calling for everybody to reevaluate this case. And I believe there is now a hearing set for November 29th as well. So being a professional in the field, I don't know how familiar you are with this case, but Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know your thoughts on whether you think there is enough evidence to prove that they were victims in this, because as far as I I could be wrong, but as far as I've seen, there hasn't been any rock solid evidence. There's been some testimony from the cousin, some testimony from the, the, the boy in Menudo who said that he was also abused, but there hasn't been anything concrete. So is there a chance that they could be released? What do you think may happen in this future hearing? And just professionally, what are your thoughts on the case as a whole? So, so this one's really hard because, you know, the biggest outcry and thing I heard was that the second trial was so unfair. And while the judge may have overstepped um, removing certain things, appellate courts have already found that uh, the decisions that he made were within the judge's discretion. It wasn't an abuse of discretion. They didn't get a new trial based on any of that and the major differences between the first and second trial. This was actually last week's podcast episode as well. But, you know, having cameras to not having cameras, uh, they ran out of money. Um, they weren't able to put in some of the abuse evidence, which was the big deal with the second trial. But the more I looked into it in reality, a lot of that came because Lyle, the older brother didn't testify in the second trial and and hit a home run in testifying in the first trial, but then maybe made some statements that he snowed the jury or had a meeting out of the palm of his hand or telling witnesses to testify and say this or say that to where if he took the stand, he would have been impeached. Well, if he no longer takes the stand. That's multiple days of evidence. That's multiple things nobody else can testify to. There's naturally going to be other evidence, other experts, other abuse that can no longer be argued because those facts aren't in evidence in the second trial. So as far as the second trial goes, I do understand at least some of the major differences. But when it comes to the new evidence that they have now, and again, it's important to remember we're talking about the second trial. We're not comparing it to the first trial. We're not saying did the jury in the first trial get it wrong. We're not looking at Lyle's testimony. All that's out. Because you only look at an appeal, what happened in that second trial? And would this information be enough to change the jury's mind? And is it actually newly discovered evidence? I do think the defense has some really good arguments, but I think that maybe the best thing in their favor right now is exactly what you mentioned, the public swell of free these boys. I even called them boys throughout the entire podcast because I had just watched the the drama, not the documentary. And that's how they make you feel when you watch it. You know, that was kind of my first exposure. And then I went and did real research on it. So, you know, I have things burned into my memory that whether true or not affect how I look at this case. And I think that's probably how a lot of the public is. But what I expect to happen is for them to look at it and make a decision. I think if they were going to make a decision purely based on the law, that there's probably not enough here, especially knowing Lyle didn't testify at the trial to overturn the verdict and give them a new trial. But if I was the prosecutor and if I was a juror, and again, I'm saying this with a major admitted bias in this case because of the way that that drama was made and that being my first experience to anything in the case, that there was some kind of abuse going on. The letter I think is pretty damning because one of my big problems is they never mentioned it. They never, even when they were admitting taking their parents' life, They never mention it. That doesn't make sense. I would think like if you're at rock bottom and the guilt is eating you up inside and you're Eric and you go to this mental health counselor that you trust that you've already treated with, I feel like you would say it and you would say, well, I did it because of this. Tell me I'm not a bad person because this happened to me and that's why I did it. And it wasn't there. That was kind of a big issue with me, but I understand, especially in the time, how hard it was for people to talk about sexual abuse, especially uh, men um, where they're, you know, strapping men that could have physically overpowered their dads and didn't but there's a psychological component and how we look at it today is much different. That was my biggest problem. So this letter from months and months before that he wrote, although it doesn't explicitly say it, definitely adds more credence and I think could have made a difference with the jury. The Menudo boy also adding credence to the propensity of the victim, meaning the dad, 
Mr. Menendez probably would be enough for me to consider saying, okay, we'll drop the charges. We'll do a manslaughter if you guys will or will plead to it. And maybe you do five more years or maybe you get out X, Y, Z, or maybe you meet with some kind of a parole board or you have some system in place. Like let's interview you and have them determine whether or not you're fit to go back out into society or not. I don't know exactly how California system is set up, but if there's something there to where if there's still a danger, we have somebody do this before we make any deals with them. If I was the prosecutor, I probably would look into some sort of scenario where if they are rehabilitated to end their prison sentence early, as opposed to them being in, in prison for life, there are some people that are going to hate that. Some people that are going to love that, but that's just kind of how I look at the case as a lawyer who's been a prosecutor and prosecuted cases before that is probably something I would consider in this situation. And I'm curious, you mentioned the letter and I haven't been able to check or verify. Have they proved that that's authentic one way or another? Cause I know there was a question of the timing of it. Yeah. I, I don't know. All I've done, all I've seen is they, they found it at the cousin or the uncle's house and that Eric who wrote the letter is corroborating that that's when he wrote it. Now, of course he could be lying. Right. And mm -hmm. that, that's the big problem with overturning the jury's verdict because the jury heard from Eric. They had the opportunity to hear from Lyle and Lyle chose to invoke his fifth amendment. Right. And the jury made the de decision to convict them of what they convicted them of. Right. Mm -hmm. They didn't choose manslaughter and they could have. So we're now going in and entering the province of the jury. And I don't like doing that. Appellate courts don't like doing that. Prosecutors don't like doing that. So that's what's so hard about overturning a verdict like this as lawyers and looking at the case later when a jury did their job and there's got to be something big for us to change that. So what do you make just as a whole of, it feels like over the last probably year, maybe year and a half now, there has been this like new, new surge of interest in more historic cases. And I don't mean historic, like super old, but Scott Peterson, Gypsy Rose, the Menendez brothers, where it almost like is re-entering pop culture in a way to where people are advocating for their innocence, that they should be released, that they were the victim. A lot of people still believe Scott Peterson is innocent and that there wasn't enough evidence to prove that his guilt, which I disagree with personally, but just as a professional in the field, what do you make of that? Of like all of these older, you know, cases that have, there's already been a verdict. Some ha gypsies already been released, but now people are reinterested in it all over again. So two main ways I'd look at this. Number one, I would hope that everybody, yourself included, will look at all this and realize how incredibly important the defendant's rights are when they are tried the first time. So every case we're looking at right now, every case that's going on right now, I don't care if it's Diddy, I don't care if it's Brian Koberger, I don't care if it's Karen Reed, whatever it is, the trial has to be fair. We can't railroad people, we can't hide evidence, we can't have bad cops, we can't have people come and lie. Every little thing, oh, but they're still guilty or they probably did it. That's a no-go. We cannot have that. Our, our system of justice has to be set up in a place where they're presumed innocent and the state has to prove them on the highest burden in the United States of America beyond a reasonable doubt every single time. And that's when it's most important is when the trial is going on. Because on the flip side, we have to be careful. We have to be careful of glamorizing or making a celebrity out of a criminal defendant or out of people that are famous for maybe infamous, right? famous for doing something horrible or doing something bad for people that are master manipulators, which a lot of these people are, and they will use that to their advantage. I mean, we talk about pen pals and people getting married in prison and people falling in love with these people. So there, there are things like that. And there is a big true crime community. And I think the true crime community comes at it from a place of wanting justice, being big fans of justice, being big fans of fairness and, and equality as this stuff goes through and making sure people's rights aren't trampled on. But I do think we have to be careful. We have to trust juries as hard as that may be. Um, and when they come with verdicts, sometimes they get it wrong. It is true. There is, a, there is a percentage of cases where they get wrong. But our appellate system is in place so that lawyers and judges can look at it a second time, a third time, make sure it's correct, make sure people's rights aren't trampled on. It's always harder to win the appeal because appeals are for losers, right? Because um, you can only appeal really if you lose in these situations. And when we look at it from that perspective, I just think we have to be really careful about getting behind certain causes when we have to realize that our knowledge of these situations is always going to be finite and it's always going to be a lot less than the people involved. And I'm not one to just say, trust the government, trust somebody else. Um, you know, they said it, so it must be true. I'm all for looking into it. I'm all for research. I'm all 
for having a contrarian view or asking questions. I think questions are the bedrock of knowledge. And so I, I think all of that is really important. I think it's good, but I do think we have to be very, very careful who and what we get behind as a community and as the public. I agree. I think that's so well said. And I know we are have to wrap up here, but I definitely need to have a follow-up conversation with you because now there's literally three more cases that just popped into my mind where I'm all, wait, but I want to know about this. I want to know about this. What are your thoughts on Wade Wilson? Like, I have so many questions. So please, like, we need to have a follow-up to this. What originally got you into, like, true crime cases? So I had been a true crime consumer since I was probably far too young. Um, to, I would watch 60 Minutes, Dateline, 48 mm -hmm. Hours, all of the things. Catch and then I would just, what was that? To Catch a Predator? Yeah, oh, exactly. Catch yeah, predator exactly. All the time. Um, all of the, all of the things. And then my fascination just grew and grew and grew because I felt like there were certain cases where I would watch that I felt like there was absolutely no justice. Perfect example, Casey Anthony. I remember exactly where I was when that verdict was read and I remember being enraged. And then there were other cases where I felt like I, I wanted to figure it out as I was learning about it. And this is just my personal opinion, but I feel like the reason that so many women are fascinated with true crime is because there is a problem solving element to it, a strategy to where we're natural born, like people with instinct and our gut feelings, and we're trying to figure things out. And so I think part of the fascination with people who watch documentaries or a dateline, it's almost trying to see if you can unlock the answer before you're told the answer. And then in that, with that, once that answer is shared or once, you know, somebody is arrested or charged, is there justice and is it being seen through till the very end? So for me, it was like, it kind of was like this slow progression that just like evolved over time where I was fascinated, interested to where then there were finally enough cases where I felt like there wasn't enough exposure. There certainly wasn't justice. People weren't talking about any of these cases. So then I just started talking about them randomly, wondering if anybody would ever listen. And it just kind of grew and grew. Yeah, I think that's probably a very similar story to so many people that watch and listen is just the fascination with this stuff. And then eventually you really get into justice, I feel like, when you mm -hmm. see what happens to people and what the world can actually look like. But um, okay, I really appreciate you coming on. I'll have everything yeah. linked to Annie in all the descriptions. Make sure you check her out. Uh, she is known as everybody's true crime bestie. So you can just sit around and talk true crime cases with her. Um, whenever you guys want to, and I'm sure she's covering tons of cases that you have questions about that we have not been able to get to. So thank you, Annie, so much for coming on. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for watching another episode of the lawyer, you know, if you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out the Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the Lawyer You Know.